I see the little red light on that says it's time to begin class. But first, before we begin class, let's have a little unscripted give and take about Gilgamesh or about anything pertaining to the class. Any questions? Any comments? I should try to look friendly and happy. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Devi. What do you got? I was confused about um, when he went to see the um, Urshanabi. Uh huh. Urshanabi is the boat man. Utnapishtim is the um, dude who got made a god. Okay. And I was confused to first as to why did he hit the boat ship thing? I know he was angry, but why? Because it was kind of random. And then what was with the whole stick and him stripping naked man? <laughs> naked, naked. Um, <laughs> naked guy swimming around in my Gilgamesh text. Get him out of there. The, my excellent answer, and we'll touch on this a little bit later, Devi, but since you asked, um, when one goes on a catabasis, and I think we're all in agreement here that this is the big catabasis that Gilgamesh goes on, that everything else is kind of like practice for this, the Humbaba thing, the um, Bowl of Heaven story. This is Gilgamesh wandering to the edge of the world, trying to meet this Utnapishtim character to find out if he too can become immortal. He cannot just like pop around the corner and go to Ut's place, okay? He cannot just say, well, uh, like the president and the provost are in Carrington Hall, which is like right over there. You could see it from the window out there saying, you yeah, know, just see, you know, ask Cliff and Frank, you know, what's up? I could do that. You have Gilgamesh traveling to the edge of the world to go see a human being who used to be a god and find out his fate there's got to be a long trip involved. And there's also got to be something, I'm not making a big deal of it this time around, but it's something I call, a concept I call the topology, typolo <laughs> topology, I was right the first time, of the underworld. That is to say, the kind of layout, the kind of appearance of hell. Because, you know, you don't usually see um, welcome to hell. <laughs> and you see, you know, a cup, it's like going into a restaurant where you got a couple of greeters. Hi, I'm a Hasbro bab. Arr, welcome to hell. Okay, you can't have that. Um, what you usually have is some kind of water. Okay. And any time you cross a body of water, that is, of course, liminal, experience big time. Um, usually, at any, the topology of hell includes scorpion man. Now I'm going to try to draw a scorpion man. It's not more like a scorpion. Well, I, and if that's not bad enough, I always make scorpion man look like the Egyptian god Ra who had a dung beetle where his head was supposed to be. But seriously, the um, idea of topography of hell is to signify that it's remote, it's far away, it's scary. Um, it's a place you don't really want to go into, and it's a place you don't really think you're going to make it out of. That's probably, I would say, maybe like a B or B-plus answer to your question, Devi, because the specifics of Gilgamesh's boat ride are um, pretty much inexplicable. It's interesting to know that when he uses a pole, he can only use it once because it rots away and goes into the water. It's just that nasty. No, I mean, it, this, liver, this river here is not like orange Gatorade, okay? It's not like Pepsi Zero. It's not like Red Bull or anything like that. It's usually pretty toxic, and there's bodily functions involved. How's that? Excellent. Other questions? Yes, question. Your name is? No, I didn't have a question. You didn't have a question. You don't have a question. I'm capable of lecturing. Taylor. I know. What was exactly that you broke? There was something else that became, like, was there an orb thing? or A what? That Gilgamesh broke. What, what exactly was it again? Stones. 
Yeah, he also broke the stone propulsion devices. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. It's just such a liberating feeling. I don't know. I know. No one knows the way it comes, the way it goes. Anybody else? Anybody else got a question that I could answer, perhaps? Okay. In our last exciting episode, we caught Gilgamesh um, traveling dressed in animal clothes to the edge of the world to find, you know, Utnapishtim, to ask him the question, hey, Ut, um, can I be immortal? And I grant you that it gets a little bit repetitive. Why is your face the one who is a face of somebody who is drawn from a long journey? Why are you covered in animal skins? Well, I'll tell you why I'm covered in animal skins in my face. I'd apologize, but I don't really feel particularly sorry about it. If any of you have ever been on a long trip, have you almost had your heart jump out of your shirt going, I wish I were done? You know, like nine hours into the... How many of you have ever ridden on a Greyhound bus? Yes, Greyhound bus. Oh, great fluffy. Isn't it just terrible? I mean, it's a... No, no, no. It's just terrible. And I just say, I want to get off. I want this to stop right now. I think the repetitions produce that kind of effect. Why well, use your face? Ah, shut up, Utna Pishtim, and tell me what's going on here. Gilgamesh knows that he is not going to get any good answer. Gilgamesh knows that he's going to die someday, and it's all become horribly real to him. But still, he has to go on. He has to trudge mile after weary mile to Mount Meshu, which could be on the test. It's part of the topology of a catabasis. It's a great big mountain where the setting sun and the rising sun meet. I don't know how that works, Taylor. I figured you were going to ask me that one next. Um, he meets Scorpion Man, who says, well, that's the gate in. He, nobody's ever gone in. Nobody's ever come out. Utnapishtim is not going to tell you anything. Gilgamesh says, I know, I got to go anyway. And then after he travels through the mountain, he meets the barmaid Siduri, whose name I write in big, gorgeous block letters, because she gives him the best answer that um, anybody's going to give him. And it goes like this. Gilgamesh, where are you hurrying to? You will never find that life for which you are looking. When the gods created man, they allotted him death, but life they retained in their own keeping. As for you, Gilgamesh, fill your belly with good things. Day and night, night and day, dance and be merry, feast and rejoice. Let your clothes be fresh, bathe yourself in water. Cherish the little child that holds your hand and make your wife happy in your embrace. For this, too, is the lot of man. If Sidiri were not a Mesopotamian demigoddess, if she spoke Latin, she could just as well have been saying carpe diem, seize the day. But all Gilgamesh really wants is directions. Siduri gives him directions to Urshanabi. And, you know, getting back to Devai's question, um, Urshanabi, like all boatmen who convey a hero over to the other side of the underworld, is kind of just annoying and vexed and just kind of a surly personality. Uh, what do you want? Ah, there's really no point in getting there. You know, ah, he ain't going to tell you anything. Just get in the boat and take me there. The, vo the voyage is long, it says here, the voyage is long, repetitive, and boring. How many of you would agree? Long, repetitive, and boring. How many of you thought, no, this is really great, I love it? Okay, good. Your name is Sierra. Mm -hmm. Did you think it was just wonderful? No. What didn't you like about it? It's just kind of like you, you're trying to picture what's going on, and they just keep saying the same thing, so it's just like... But I already explained to you, right, that it's a big, long, huge journey, and it's the best they can do, and stuff like that. 
It's like listening to a four-year-old saying, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Once they get to Utnapish, Tim Gilgamesh will get a message, but it won't be the mission he, missile he wants. And now I speak unto you the parable of the flood. A parable is a short, concise story which explains a concept via an analogy. That's what I typed on my webpage. And as I think I indicated you to, before, to you before, if you do choose to visit the Tunnel of Oppression on campus in Wells Hall tonight, no, on Wednesday night and Thursday night, you will be taken to different rooms where you will see people getting hassled for either being the wrong religion or the wrong sexual orientation or the wrong color or the wrong age or the wrong whatever. Do they have a room where they hassle people for having um, receding hairlines? Well, I'm outraged. I'm going to go protest something. <laughs> I mean, the idea is you watch this, you know, Arabic girl being persecuted because she's walking around with the Koran. You learn something about religion. You see, well, I'm not going to preach. I'm not going to preach. What's going to happen is Gilgamesh is going to get told a story, and he's just not going to buy it because he doesn't want to. Because I can tell you as an old coot on the wrong side of 50, you know you aren't going to live forever but you really don't want to consider it. You don't really want to dwell on it. Or as my dad said, he turned 83, well, I haven't had the big dirt nap just yet. Utna Pishtim, the man who used to be a god, the god who used to be a man, sees this guy covered in beast skins walking up his beach. And we go through the, why should not my cheeks be starved and my face be drawn sort of thing. Gilgamesh is probably looking kind of like this. Like that old guy in the Monty Python <laughs> skit. It's, uh, you know, he's, I mean, and he's wearing animal skins. I don't know what animal. Maybe he'll be wearing zebra skins today. I have no idea. I was told that I should draw more on the board. Would you like to see more of these kinds of drawings? Yeah. Well, they're supposed to be scary. Remember, Siduri was kind of scary when she saw him for the first time. And Siduri's a bartender. She's a goddess and a bartender for the gods. And she was still kind of scared. Good. Uh, th there, that improved him somewhat. <laughs> And Gilgamesh says basically to Utnapishtim, how shall I see, find the life that I am seeking? How do I get to be immortal too? And Utnapishtim lays it on him right from the start. There is no permanence. Do we build a house to stand forever? Do we seal a contract to hold for all time? Do brothers divide an inheritance to keep forever? Does the flood time of rivers endure? It is only the nymph of the dragonfly who sheds her larva and sees the sun in his glory. From the days of old, there is no permanence. I pause here. This is a general education class. There's a chance that we may have somebody in here who has taken a biology course, may even be a biology major or know something about zoology. What's the idea about a dragonfly shedding her larva? Anybody? I'm not exactly Mr. Science Boy over here either, okay? I'm guessing it's the same thing as a caterpillar forming a cocoon and kind of like pooping out a butterfly after that is, you know, all said and done. The ancients were very impressed by these things. Heck, I was when I was a little kid. Not so much that I ever wanted to take biology or do my biology homework, so I didn't and got a very bad grade. But other than things like snakes, butterflies, and nymphos or whatever, um, nothing ever gets born again. But if you must, I guess I'll tell you a story. 
And what Utnapishtim tells him, as old people will do, is a big, huge, honking story that he should get something out of. It's about how he and his wife, Mrs. Utnapishtim, I call them the Utnapishtims, became gods, and he says, I will reveal to you a mystery. I will tell you a secret of the gods. Enlil, who is the supreme god, his name means Lord Wind, and I'm writing his name down on the board. He's listed as Ea. I prefer Enki. It's my class, so there. Enlil says that the uproar of mankind is intolerable. Those humans are just reproducing too much and making too much noise, and I want to smack them. Where have you heard this before? Where in the Bible? Who said that? Okay, Janelle? Ryan. Janelle's over there. You're messing with me. Okay, go ahead. Keep working it, Ryan. Work the wall. Hey, me too. Yeah, Noah's Ark. Okay, God is displeased with the humans. They're being really bad. What happened with the Tower of Babel? What was the whole idea about the Tower of Babel? Yeah, exactly. So, whap. Um, Enlil decides that they're making too much noise, so he decides to send this big, huge flood. Too many people. Enlil is mad. He's mad. He's having a bad day. He's having a bad hair day. I don't know. I'm going to destroy the universe. Enki, otherwise known as Ea. I like Enki better. The name En, E-N hyphen means Lord. Enlil is Lord Wind. Enki is Lord Water. Guess who's the boss? Lord Wind makes Lord Water just flood the whole place. But first, Enki says, hey, 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 it's me, the talking wall. Yeah, you. Ut, load everybody up, build a boat, and say, I think it's going to rain. They'll laugh at you. He tells them a big, huge honking story. And pretty soon the water, the storm comes down, the waters rise. Utnapishtim is scared. Mrs. Utnapishtim are, is scared. The animals on the boat are scared. Even the gods and goddesses are scared that they've kind of overdone this punishment thing. Finally, the SS Utnapishtim lands on Mount Nisir. Utnapishtim, sound familiar, comes out, starts offering a sacrifice to all the ancient Sumerian gods and goddesses. Ishtar shows up and says, Enlil, you're not invited, you jerk. The ancient Sumerian gods and goddesses are just like a bunch of bickering kids. And Enlil shows up, and then Shamash, I think, and Enki kind of tag team him to just, you know, say, yeah, nice going, destroying the whole world. Why didn't you just like bore them to death? Why didn't you just, you know, make them get sick and die? You almost took us out with that stupid flood of yours, Enlil. Enlil thinks fast. He's got to do something to make it up to the other gods and goddesses to show he's a regular deity. He says, okay, you and you, Mrs. Utnapishtim, Mr. Utnapishtim, you are here by gods. The end. Was it because they were good people? No. As a matter of fact, are the gods and goddesses even good people in Mesopotamian myth? No. Pardon? Yeah, you have a good point, Devi. You know, the other answer is, of course they are. And I start backing towards the door before the lightning hits me or something like that. But um, this is a parable. Basically, the gods are jerks. You know, Enlil gets mad, almost destroys the universe. Ishtar starts screaming at Enlil. Enki and Shamash start screaming at him. They decide to just make a human being a god and god at, at, at random. The obvious lesson is, Who's going to do this for you, Gilgamesh? The answer is nobody. You might as well deal with it. I pause. The next exciting segment will be called Oh, to be young again. 
Um, speaking as somebody who has passed the sunny side of 50, I don't really do much to try to be young again. My hair has turned gray, my beard has turned gray. I'm just happy that these particular hairs are still in my head, okay? I work out endlessly. Occasionally, I get a little bit thinner. You know, my body now creaks and stuff like that. I call my dad to say, Dad, my body says, ah, this is what it gets like. Wait until you get to be my age. And then I hang up on my dad because I really don't need this information anymore. When I was 39, I did indeed buy a red 1999 Mustang. It was indeed my midlife crisis car. I did indeed get busted for speeding in it within three weeks of buying it, much to the delight of my wife. <laughs> I thought she was mad. She was worse than mad. She laughed at me. She laughed at me in my midlife crisis Mustang getting busted for speeding. I'm not better than anybody else, but I mean, isn't it terrible when you see women who are around, I'll pick on 50-year-olds because I am one, dyeing their hair colors that don't occur naturally anywhere? Or a 50-year-old guy doing the sexy comb-over thing. You familiar with the concept of comb-over? Did I tell you about comb-overs? Here's an example of a comb-over. <laughs> this guy is bald and can't own it the way I do. What he does is he grows his hair really long over on this side. When he gets long enough, he combs it over. And it only covers exactly, exactly. But ladies don't laugh. I mean, ladies have these jeans, wear jeans that are three sizes too small, plus heels, plus the hair, plus the makeup. There are people in this world who are really busting their tails to look younger than they really are, and I can't for the life of me imagine why anymore. I think my beloved young wife laughed it out of me when I was driving that 99 Mustang that I kept. For one winter, it was rear-wheel drive. That sucked, and I got rid of it. You may sit here and laugh yourselves too, but trust me, you will all be pushing 40. You will all be pushing 50 someday. I'll be in the old professor's retirement home, but come over and visit me so I can laugh at you. So I can laugh at your hair and your clothes and the music. I love that Eminem music. What is that? The Eminem? I'm down with that. I know. Yeah, peep. <laughs> Okay, well, but you don't look like you're in your 40s, Sammy. That's the problem. You're just, huh? Well, hey, look, aren't we all? Aren't we all? This is what Utnapishtim does, and I don't think it's very nice. He said, nobody's going to call the gods together for you. But I tell you what, can you stay awake for seven days and seven nights? The most I've ever stayed awake is something like 32 or 33 hours. I can't sleep on planes. I just get all jacked up and go, man, I'm going to Russia. Man, I'm going to Poland. Or, man, I'm going home. Can't sleep. Wandering the streets of Moscow on like 31, 32 hours sleep. That's a catabasis, but I'm not going to try that. How long have you stayed awake? What is your name again? My baby sister will kill me for not knowing your name. What's the longest you ever stayed up? Um, Who has really just stayed up too long? Your name is Killer? Um, okay, I may name you Killer, though. Okay, <laughs> Killer, how long have you stayed awake? Um, like 36 hours. 36. Can we, anybody be 36? Uh, three whole days, uh, I was introduced to uh, Bailey's Irish Cream and Coffee. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Why? I was 25, and, and I was up for three days straight. I could not sleep. Anybody beat that? Okay, the reason why I ask is I, I, I fall asleep after 32, 33 hours, and now I'm lucky if I can stay awake for 18 hours in a row, and it only gets worse. Gilgamesh is going to pull a seven-day all-nighter. And, of course, weak, frail mortal that he is, he starts going... That's not bad enough. They're going to let him sleep for seven days and seven nights 
and Mrs. Utnapishtim is going to place by his side This is kind of like a cuneiform zzzzed. A fresh loaf of bread. And then the next day, another fresh loaf of bread. Meanwhile, this one's starting to get kind of gamungi. You understand gamungi. For seven straight days, she puts a new loaf of bread next to him. The day seven bread is still good. The day six bread is kind of iffy. The day five bread's got mold. The day four bread has got mold and stinks. The day three bread has dried up to about this size. How am I doing? Well, how about day two? It looks like somebody's intestines. <laughs> and the day one bread is just so nasty, words can't even describe it. And he wakes up, says, well, am I a god yet? And he looks at these seven pieces of bread in various stages of this decay parable again. He gets to see himself as mature, kind of old, really old, really old, really old, dirt nap bait, and, and this just brings it home to him that not only is he going to die, He's also going to get old, and he's also going to disintegrate, and his hair is going to fall out, and his knees are going to go, and his neck is going to start to hurt, and his just really, just really awful. At this point, Mrs. Utnapishtim, oh, well, I, I got to say, I got to say, Utnapishtim is willing to dress him up in nice, clean clothes and send him home. Here, you get a brand new suit. Clean up. I'm sending you home. Mrs. Ut. Yeah, Taylor? I was going to say, um, didn't he offer him to be a god first, though? I don't remember. Did you say Basically, it's if you can stay awake for seven days and seven nights, you can become a god. Okay. Um, it's like, you know, Taylor, if you can stay awake for seven days and seven nights, I'll give you an A in this class. Or I'll name you King of England after, Queen, after Betsy dies. Okay. 24 hours of sleep, and I can just... No, now. Now? I mean, <laughs> I'll give you a million dollars. It's just unbelievable. He can't do it. They're just rubbing his... <laughs> if only... The, it's like if my dog had opposable thumbs, she would rule the world. The... Um, it's just really nasty. So Mrs. Gil, Mrs. Utnapishtim says, Now, Ut, don't you think we should give him a present? Okay, there is this plant. It's down at the bottom of the sea. It's contained in a pineapple under the sea. <laughs> Actually, it's not. It's down at the bottom of the sea. It's got prickles and thorns and stuff like that. It's called The Old Men Are Young Again. And it says, okay, yeah, there's this plant. Sorry, honey, my wife's right. There's a plant down there. You want to swim down, you can have this plant. And it will make everybody young again, including your own bad self. And Gilgamesh immediately jumps down into the water, ties rocks to his feet, which is not encouraged, um, to dive down and get this thing. He gets it, brings it back into the boat. He says, yes, I'm going to share this with all the old men in town. Yes. Hey, Urshanabi, boatman, get me home. It's time to be young again. Um, they make commercials about this kind of thing in the United States of today. <laughs> um, they make makeup commercials. They make clothes commercials. They make Viagra commercials. There's, what's this thing where the guy's throwing a football through a swing that's going back and forth? They're all marketing being young again, okay? Selling red Mustangs to 39-year-old guys and stuff like that. There's a lot of money in making people my age feel like they're kind of young. Gilgamesh and Urshanabi pull up for the night. They sleep, and they find out that a snake has stolen the dang plant. Then he throws off his skin, 
you know, because he's a snake, damn it. And um, Gilgamesh realizes that he is good and completely hosed. He is not going to live forever. He is never going to be young again. I guess he'd better go home and do what Siduri told him. Enjoy life as much as he can. He sits down and cries. Here, I should draw some tears coming. Well, he, now he's looking kind of like the Cyclops. Here's some tears. He's crying because he's very unhappy. It's finally dawned on him that he too is going to watch his body fall apart on him and go. I think that we can understand at this point what the preface of the poem is saying. The preface, you'll remember, and it's repeated at the end, says this, was the, this too was the work of Gilgamesh who knew the countries of the world. He was wise, he saw mysteries and knew secret things. He brought us a tale of the days before the flood. He went a long journey, was weary, worn out with labor, and returning engraved on a stone the entire story. It wasn't his epic wrestling match, his mano a mano duel with Enkidu that made him so great. Although that was pretty good. It wasn't his epic adventure against Humbaba in the land of the living, in the forest with wood, where he's yelling out to Shamash, hey, help me, Shamash, help, help me, Shamash. That was pretty good. But Gilgamesh's greatest achievement of all was growing up. At the beginning of the story, at the beginning of the tale, he's awful, he's terrible. He has none of the public affairs -y virtues we have a right to demand in a hero taught at Missouri State University. <laughs> I mean, he has no ethical leadership. He's the king, but he just runs around having sex with whatever he wants to because he's the king. He has no cultural competence. Basically, I'm the king, and I can do whatever I want. That's not culturally competent. And his community engagement tends to take the form of having sex with people who attract his interest. All bad. But by coming into contact with Enkidu, the guy who is civilized by the quote-unquote harlot Shamhat, by watching Enkidu die, by traveling after Enkidu dies, by coming into contact with all these wisdom features, figures by going on a catabasis, okay, Gilgamesh finally grows up and is able to accept his lot as a human being. He goes on some really great adventures, and he can't divide, just pop over to Craig Hall. He can't just go over to the get-and-go, you know, put a quarter in a machine and get wisdom dispensed to him or put his credit card in the reader and have wisdom dispensed to him. He's got to travel. He's got to suffer. He has to have it beaten into his head in the worst possible way that he is mortal. And once he does, he cries. But he also writes it down. He also shares this story with his people and he shares his story with us in an attempt to give us the benefit of his experience. Now granted, when you're sitting in the waiting room in the hospital while someone you love is having surgery and you're dreading the surgeon coming to tell you really horrible, awful news and you feel like your brain's going to explode, you don't or I don't, derive a horrible amount of, you know, support knowing that Gilgamesh had been through this too. But as I go through the day, as I read this story over and over again, I can't help but feel like, you know, this life I've been given, and I thank God for it, is a precious gift. It doesn't always work out the way I want to, but, you know, that's the way it always goes. Gilgamesh is told before he dies in a dream 
Enlil of the mountain says, In nether earth the darkness will show him a light. Of all that are known, none will leave a mountain for, monument for generations to compare with his. The heroes, the wise men, the, the new moon, have their waxing and waning. Men will say, Who ever ruled with might and with power like Gilgamesh? I wonder, you know, how people can say, who else traveled so far? Who else told quite a story? Gilgamesh's story is great to me because like everybody else in this room, well, you still are young. He was young. He thought he was going to live forever. He thought, you know, in certain contexts, he could do anything he wanted to. The rules didn't apply to him. And he found out he was wrong, and he learned how to deal with it. O Gilgamesh, Lord of Kolob, it says at the end, great is your praise. I pause now for questions. Did you want to ask me about Gilgamesh? Anything regarding to the story, anything regarding to what you might expect to see on a test down the line? Anything at all? Yeah, go ahead. What kind of when he turned when he came back was he a better king or or would you know anything about that? I can only guess, Taylor, and I would guess the answer is that he is indeed. You, if you go back and look in the text, you'll notice that when he announces that um, he's going to go fight Humbaba, the counselors of the town say, "Don't do it." Okay, they don't want him to go get killed. And it's the same thing when um, Gilgamesh dies. Um, they don't go, huh, <laughs> hasta la vista, Gil. You know, dump him down a manhole. You know, there, there seems to be genuine grief at his passing. So I would infer from that that he does pick up some ethical leadership skills along the way. But again, I could be getting public affairsy. Other questions, other questions. Going once, going twice. Yes, go ahead. Your name is? Chris. Chris, go ahead. Um, do you know, like, like how long you would say, like, from the beginning of the story, like, how many years have passed until they finally, I guess, made a full transformation? Good question, good question. Um, if I were to ask, I would say that Gilgamesh did all of this. I'm In his, I would just, damn, that's a good question, or... Leap, that's a good question. I'd say he seems to me to be so 20-something, okay? And I know that, you know, most, if not all of you in this room are in your 20s somewhere. I'm not saying it to be a jerk, but I still think he's still pretty young when he goes on this journey to Gilgamesh, goes on his, to Utnapishtim, and that he lives, I'd like to think, a good long time, a good meaningful life, knowing the things that he knows. But... Can't really say that for sure. Yes, Camille? Oh, no, you got to watch it with the hand because I will call on you. Your name is? Becky. Becky, what's your question? Oh, poop. No more questions? Yes, yeah, Sammy. It mentions his wife, Gilgamesh's wife, but there's no more mention? Um, it just says make your wife happy in your embrace. That just means enjoy having sex. But yeah, with your wife, because they really, thanks, Lee, they really do kind of work that ethical action in there. Um, I think that the Sumerians did have some concept of ethical leadership, expectations of a king. And remember, he was, Gilgamesh was kind of bad at the beginning of the poem about breaking into people's weddings and saying, I get to be with the bride first. So, yeah, and, be, and it's also a woman telling him this, right? You know, he's not gonna, she's not going to say, go out and score with the babes. <laughs> okay. Um, I, again, I think it's just a nice way of saying um, enjoy eating, enjoy drinking, enjoy having spiffy clothes, enjoy sex. I don't really know if he is or isn't. I would assume that as a king... He needs to have little, was that you, Ryan? I can't even hardly see you back there, but I knew, <laughs> I knew that was you. Um, 
really, I, th I can answer this. <clears throat> In order to make sure there is a clear transfer of power, Ryan, um, the king and queen must have kids, okay? It's obligatory. Um, I mean, look at Prince Charles, right, of England. Um, he had to have kids. He had to find some woman who would marry him and have kids so there could be future kings and queens of England. I would guess that Gilgamesh did get married. I would guess that Gilgamesh did have kids. But the major important thing is the story of how Gilgamesh grew up. How's that? That's a great question. The answer I gave you may be a B minus, but it's the best I can do. Okay, other questions, other questions, other questions. Okay, next. In our next exciting episode, we're going to be discussing Book 11 of Homer's Odyssey, the story of how Odysseus, the king of Ithaca, last seen busting into the Cyclops' cave, stealing stuff, who has been completely faithful to his wife the entire time, comes home after a 20-year trip. I pause for a question there. Uh, were you serious when you said he was completely faithful? Does anybody want to argue with me? No, not you. I know you can argue with me. Anybody over here arguing with me? Who's giving me the side eye over there? Sierra, are you giving me the side eye? Are you suggesting he wasn't faithful to his wife Penelope the entire time? What about when he stayed with that woman? That, that, that woman. <laughs> hey, you woman, you, Camille. Okay. <laughs> no, God, who said Athena? The earth is going to open up and swallow you. Okay, let me erase some of... Oh. That's Athena. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's just something I say to get you interested. Odysseus did spend 10 years in the Trojan War. Odysseus did um, spend nine years wandering the Mediterranean for years and years, trying to get home to his wife Penelope. And yeah, it's true. He did have sex with Circe, the witchy goddess on the island of Aia. And it's true, too, that he did spend seven years as the boy toy of the goddess Calypso on her island in the middle of nowhere and stuff like that. But yes, he was faithful to Penelope the entire time. By the way, please feel free to argue with me on tests or in class. Sometimes I just speak utter and complete falsehoods just to get people to respond. I, I mean, I, much as I love the sound of my own voice, I like other people to talk to. Simply put, the year is 1200 BC. Here is my map of the ancient Greek and Asia Minor and ancient Egyptian world. We'll draw a happy little Italy over here, pervert. Um, kicking Sicily over through the Straits of Gibraltar. I used to ask people if they recognized this until somebody flung up his hand and said, yeah, that looks like my mom. <laughs> the ancient Greeks live here. The, well, there. The city of Troy is over here. The city of Troy is lived in by Trojans. Wow. Yeah, I know. Did everybody get that down? Um, <laughs> and basically, the Trojan War, so-called 10-year Trojan War, where the Greeks fought a war to take Helen back from Troy, the ancient Greeks believed it happened. The ancient Greeks believed it happened, and they believed that the heroes, the Greek heroes of the Trojan War, were the greatest Greeks who ever lived. These included Achilles, the great warrior, um, Hector, who was on the Trojan side, but he was pretty spiffy too, a worthy at, um, opponent. There was Menelaus, Mr. Helen, he won't be on the test. 
But um, for some odd reason, in the movie Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, one of the characters is Menelaus past the biscuits Papio Daniel. Never did figure that out. After all is said and done, after the whole Trojan horse episode and stuff like that, Menelaus, who is Helen's husband, is going to kill her because he can. And Helen comes out, she says, oh, hi, Menelaus, and she flashes him. And his brain goes, gazong, and he forgets to kill her. Well, she is Zeus's daughter, so. Well, yeah. Well, even Zeuslings get killed here. And Odysseus. The Iliad, which covers the end of the Trojan War, is not a poem about the Trojan War, really. It's about the last few weeks of the Trojan War, what happens when Achilles gets angry. Achilles gets angry because he has to give his slave girl back. He gets all huffy, and the Greek Trojans start to kick the Greeks' butts. I'm not going to get into the plot. It's basically, it's wonderful. It's just awesome. But it's also people just getting killed all the time. And if you think Gilgamesh is repetitive, I mean, just imagine some guy just like standing there, and they throw a spear, and it goes through his eye socket, and it transfixes his eye to a post, kind of like an olive on a martini swizzle stick. And multiply that by about 24 books. I know that my colleague, Dr. Nugent, is going to scalp me if she hears me saying that, but I got to go with what I got. The people, and the other great poem is the Odyssey, the story of how Odysseus gets home to his wife Penelope. It's important to me to give you a little bit of the backstory, because just as Gilgamesh is like a, oh crap, I used to be an 18-year-old. You never believe it to look at me. I had long hair too, which I wore parted in the middle. Um, that's a joke, get it? I'm parted in the middle. I remember having these two 18-year-old buttheads living downstairs for me, and they played music too loud, and they just made all this god-awful racket. And when I came down and politely asked them to just shut the heck up, please, once in a while, I was trying to sleep. They said, well, we're 18, we're on our own now. Nobody tells us what to do. Life will tell you what to do, Okay. These dorks had a lot to learn. Their car got stolen from the carport. <laughs> hey, professor, professor, that car, car got stolen. Well, that's really sad. Darn. <laughs> These people live by a code. It's called the heroic code. And Odysseus doesn't go by it at all. But the heroic code is kind of like the way Gilgamesh lives. Since life is short, death is eternal, you should enjoy living. You should enjoy the things of the body. You should enjoy food and drink and nice clothes as long as you want because you're going to die after that and it's, going to, it's just going to be awful. Okay? That's pretty much what the Sumerians have to give us in 2800 B.C., that's pretty much how the Greeks tell us in 1200 B.C. and in 750 B.C. when they write all this stuff down. It's basically life is nasty, brutish, and short. Chris, or were you just whacking on the wall? Whacking on the wall, yeah. It's like SOS. You want somebody to come and bust you out of here. He won't stop talking. Help, help. It's the old, they even have an old guy who is 300 years old who talks all the damn time. His name is Nestor, and he's like the energized bunny of lectures. And if he had PowerPoint, the ancient Greeks never would have survived <laughs> because he can tell you two hours about anything. Cloudy out there, Nestor. Why, I remember 231 years ago back when I was... <laughs> he's that boring, even more boring than me. The Iliad is what happens when Achilles gets mad. The Odyssey, Odysseus is trying to get home to his wife. 
the ancient Greeks believed that the two most important things in life were arete. And arete is just virtue that you win by killing people, by carrying off women. It may be a mind, you, it's more the kind of thing you can just throw in there for an extra point on an essay test or something like that. And kleos, which is slightly more important. It's an ancient Greek word for fame. And it's the same thing that Gilgamesh is looking for when he wins to K-L-E-O-S. It's the same thing that Gilgamesh is looking for when he wants to stamp his name on the bricks. He wants to be remembered after he dies, just like the very famous Hill. This is Hill Hall, right? Who in the hell was Hill? Thank you for sharing that. No. His name was Clyde F. Hill, and he was one of the presidents of the university early on. Craig was a professor. Um, Seisloff was a math professor. Um, now it costs you like $9 million to get something named after yourself. But, I mean, these are the kind of things people do to win a name for themselves, okay? And they would rather get killed than be dishonored because even if you lead the ancient Greek side and women carried off cattle mutilated and cities sacked for eight straight years, all you do is just wuss out even once. And you have dishonored your name forever and ever and ever. Odysseus, on the other hand, makes it out of the battle. He just wants to get home to Penelope. Odysseus was the one of two draft dodgers in the entire Trojan War. Draft dodger number one was Achilles himself. His mom said, Achilles, I don't want you to go off to war because I'm a goddess and I know you're going to die if you go into war. But mom, I like to fight in war. War is good. She makes Achilles dress up as a girl and makes him dress up and go to the island of nubile young women, which is where a bunch of young women live, you know? And the Greeks know they need Achilles for the war effort. We won't even get into how old Achilles is. He's either nine months old or nine years old, but he's also the go-to guy, the most valuable killer. But his mom said he has to dress up and drag and hang out with a bunch of girls. He doesn't really want to, but that's like his mom telling him so. He doesn't want to go fight, and Odysseus really doesn't want to go fight. He wants to stay with his Wife, Penelope, and their little bitty baby, Telemachus, and their dog, Argos. They have a puppy named Argos. He's so cute. He made me cry. Look, Odysseus tries to pretend he's insane. Not unlike the famous character on the famous TV show, M.A.S.H., how many of you are familiar with the TV show MASH and have seen 9 million episodes of it? What's your name, Fiji? Tony. Tony. What's the name of the corporal who doesn't want to be in the Army? Oh, help. Somebody. No, not you. You're almost as old as I am, for God's sake. Who else? You're laughing over there, son. What's your name? Trent. Trent. I have no idea. Oh, great flying fluffy. Bethany. His name is Corporal Klinger. How does Corporal Klinger try to get out of serving in the Korean War? Your name? Uh, Hunter. Hunter. Yes, he is insane, and he wears women's clothing all the time. And he comments on how beautiful he is and stuff like that. He's like sashaying around, and he gets very hurt if you don't think he looks pretty. But obviously, if he wants to get kicked out of the war, then he's not crazy. And he has to stay. Same thing with Odysseus. He starts pretending he's nuts. <sighs> he starts, he yokes up an aardvark and a pony, you know, and um, a bl th blind three-legged wiener dog. And he starts plowing his fields with salt. <laughs> I'm crazy, I'm crazy. What they do is they take little bitty baby Telemachus out of Penelope's arms and put little baby Telemachus in the furrow that Odysseus is plowing. 
this is really evil because he's got two choices. He can either plow right over his kid and get out of the war. He can't do that. He loves the little nipper. So he, whoa, pulls up just short. He does not run over his kid. And the other Greeks say, okay, Odysseus, you're going to the war. Get on the boat. Well, this makes Odysseus so mad that Odysseus gets on the boat and they sail past the island of nubile young women. And somebody says, hey, Achilles is on that island. Oh, is he really, thinks Odysseus. Well, if I got to go to this stupid war over a woman, <laughs> then um, so does Achilles. So this is what they do. They pull up to the island and say, um, we're traveling salesmen. We have all sorts of cute things like scrunchies and makeup and shoes and little coach purses and, you know, braces. And they just list all this stuff out and they spread it out on a table. And all the nubile young girls come up, and they start looking, oogieing over the makeup and all the girly girl stuff and the foofy socks. And Hey, I'm not a girl, I don't know. And then over on one corner of the table, there's like a rocket launcher and some grenades. And the really funny looking, strange nubile young girl comes up to it. And she's kind of eyeing that stuff up. At this point, Odysseus blows his mighty war horn, or, or something like that. The girls stuff the goodies into their purses and go run away. The strange, tall-looking girl grabs a rocket launcher, swings it around, says, bring it. I kill, get on the boat. And they go fight the Trojan War. The Trojan War had no winners at the end. A lot of the Greek heroes get killed, too. Odysseus wants to get home to his wife. And just as Gilgamesh is the story, basically, uh, Chris, you know, you pointed it out when you asked me how old he is. You know, some young punk who grows up and hopefully has a nice life after he learns his lesson. Odysseus is an old married guy who hasn't seen his wife in, like, 19 years. And I'll give it away, I guess, when I tell you, yeah, I've been saying for years that Odysseus was faithful to his wife the entire time. Well, no, he did have sex with other females. He had sex with goddesses. You could argue on his behalf that if you are a mortal man and you run into a goddess who can help you or kill you because she's a goddess and you're only a mortal man, and she says, Sleep with me. What's a guy going to do? You know, of course, she's really hot, but you guys got to do what a guy's got to do. The reason why I say that Odysseus was faithful to Penelope the entire time is as follows. For the first four books of the Odyssey, we don't see Odysseus at all. It's everybody else talking about him. Wish he'd come back. Uh, there's a bunch of suitors who are devouring all the food in Odysseus's house. And Penelope says to them, you know, you young pups, I will marry one of you one day. I'm just weaving this sh burial shroud for my father-in-law. The only two males with any brains in the entire Odyssey, Zeus and Odysseus. All of the other males are stupid as rocks. Penelope says every night, well, I'm weaving this burial shroud for my father-in-law, and when I'm finished, I will, you know, decide which of you studs I want to marry. And every night she unravels it. And they're so stupid, they don't know she's unraveling it. She's weaving and putting things together. They're a bunch of dumb boys who chop things up into bits, and they just don't get it. Telemachus starts whining. Mom! He's about 19. Not to rat on anybody who's 19. He's about Gilgamesh's age. But where Gilgamesh is like a king who can run around and do whatever he wants, Telemachus is this prince stuck in the same house as dad's house, and his dad's gone, and these suitors are hassling his mom, and he's such a wimp he can't do it. Mom! 
This is what happens to Telemachus. Telemachus is whining, and all of a sudden he sees this guy named Mentor. Mentor is a wise old man, and he says, Telemachus, son, it's time to stop being a kid. It's time to grow the hell up. Get a bunch of guys together, get on a boat, and go ask somebody where the hell your dad's been. And stop your whining, you turd. And then he turns into a bird. And then he flies away. And Telemachus thinks, oh, that must be a god. No, it was not a god. It was a goddess. It was Athena changing herself into a bird to tell him, you twit, grow up. Then and only then, in the beginning of book five, do we see Odysseus. He is sitting on the dock of the bay, watching the tide roll away. He is crying. He has been on Calypso's island for seven years. Gentlemen, who should play Calypso in this movie? Anybody want to volunteer? Somebody to play Calypso. Killer, you got any ideas? Who would play Calypso? Lady Gaga? Okay. All right. All right. Angelina Jolie says, Hey, big boy. All you need to do to be immortal is just keep me amused. <laughs> and since she never sees any guys coming through there, um, she keeps him good and amused. And he keeps her good and amused. But when he's not keeping her good and amused, he is sitting on the dock of the bay looking towards his home island of Ithaca, thinking about his wife, Penelope. He doesn't know if Penelope is still alive after 19 years. He doesn't know if she's remarried, if she's alive. He doesn't know if she'd take him back, if he made it there in one piece. He knows by now Poseidon hates him. He also knows by this point, he's been to the underworld, he's been on Catabasis, and he knows what happens to you after you die. Anybody get read ahead? What's it like in the ancient Greek afterlife? How happy is it? Are you volunteering, Camille? Excellent. It is really, really awful. Pardon? Yeah, Hercules is down there whining and stuff like that. It's awful. It's horrible. It goes on forever and ever. It's worse, if possible, than the Mesopotamian afterlife. It sucks. Because you get a fancy name. My point is this. This is why Odysseus was faithful. He knows this. He gets to interview people on his catabasis in the underworld. He talks to famous dead heroes and warriors. He sees people punished for their great crimes. His mom basically tells him what happens to you after you die. And he knows it's not too pretty. But there he is, sitting on the dock of the bay at the beginning of Book 5 of the Odyssey, crying because even though he has a chance to become an immortal god basically just kind of like pleasuring Angelina Jolie throughout all <coughs> eternity even though he doesn't know if Penelope's still alive whether she's remarried whether she'd take him back anyway if he made it there which is also not very likely because Poseidon hates him Athena says daddy Zeus you got to spring my man Odysseus. And the messenger god Hermes comes down to Calypso as one god to another, you know. Hey, Herm. Hey, Cal. Um, sorry, Calypso. I'm here from Zeus up on Mount Olympus. He has decreed that you have to let Odysseus go. What? Yeah, you gods. You gods are like male sluts. You go around and do it with everything that moves that you think is cute, and you get away with it because you're gods. But just let a goddess get her hands on a nice-looking guy for a short little while. And, no, Calypso, you have to give her back. Calypso is very, very angry. She's hoping against hope that maybe Odysseus will want to stay. She is, after all, a goddess. She is going to make him a god, too, if he'll just... You know, what would Gilgamesh have answered to that? Sign me up! But no. 
Odysseus says, I want to see if I can make it home to Penelope. And he kind of does, and the story of what happens when they get together and is, in my estimation, just unbelievably gut-splittingly funny. There's a war of wits between Odysseus and Penelope, but basically, in our next exciting class, we're going to take Odysseus on his catabasis.